Thank you, Hannah, for greeting us. That was my granddaughter, who some of you know from years past, and she was with us during one of our Kenyan trips. It was great to see her and her family uh, last week out west. The announcements, the exciting announcements that I want to bring our attention to again this afternoon, the picnic, we're just going to gather and enjoy seeing each other, even if from a, a, a short distance, but we're going to gather together. But then next Sunday, August 1st, we will worship together in the sanctuary as live as we can be and as happy as we can be to be together again. So next Sunday, please register in advance so we can prepare properly. But next Sunday, August 1st, we are gathering together in the sanctuary. Let me pray before we enter our worship time. Father, you are the God of creation, the God of heaven and earth. Father, you are the God of our salvation and the God of eternity. We confess we bear witness to, we, we share our testimony of what we know about you, what we believe about you, what we put our faith in about you. And as we reflect on these beliefs this morning, reveal them to us in a new and moving and transforming way. Amen. It says in Romans, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we are saved. This idea of confessing the Lord Jesus, 
is important. We state it. We make a confession. We state the creed. We repeat the Apostles' Creed as a statement, as a confession, um, in that, in a sense, that old way of thinking of the word confession isn't confessing our sins, it is just stating our belief. So there's two ideas or connotations of that word. So the songs we are gathering and singing together this morning are about our creed, if you will, about our beliefs. I believe, very much the song of the creed. The song about our God. The song about worthy is the Lamb. Who is Jesus? And the culmination of that is who then am I? Based on our belief. Based on our experience. Based on our reality. So sing with us the content of our confession.
water you turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power, our God, our God. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like. No one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power Our God Our God Our God is greater Worthy is the 
is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. At Priory, we value people of all ages, including children. Part of the way that we express this is by offering a blessing to the kids in our church family each week. If you are with a child or a young person, please place your hand on their shoulder with their permission as we speak truth into their lives. Today's blessing is taken from Luke 2, verse 52. Let our children and youth grow as Jesus did in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Amen. 
If you'd like, we've posted on our Facebook page a link to some resources for kids this morning. It's free, it updates every week, and it gives the young ones in our congregation an age-appropriate opportunity to learn too. Before we continue further in the service, let me pray. Father, this has been a long period of anxieties and concerns and worries, and we have to turn our hearts to thanksgiving that you have been with us, you have worked with us, you have been with us, you have grown us up through this time, and I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your presence here this morning, and as we anticipate gathering together in community once again, we just thank you for that opportunity. Lord, we continue to think of the people in our community who continue to have high anxieties or very serious physical, financial, spiritual, emotional concerns. We won't name them all here, but you know who they are, and you are with them, and you are with them through us as community, through the friends that they reach out to, and for us who reach out to them. We just pray for the hurting people and ask that you are the God of all comfort. We pray for our leadership as we anticipate regathering and almost relaunching certain parts of our ministry, but we are now looking forward, and I just pray for our leadership as we do look forward into the rest of the summer, the fall, and beyond. Guide us, I pray. Be with us, I pray, as we anticipate good things through your hand and through your work and through your spirit. Father, I pray a, a blessing on us as many of us are seeking times of rest and holiday and vacation. I'm thankful for Diane's and my visit out west and Pastor Dave's um, time at Muskoka Conference and other people will be taking breaks and holidays, and I just pray that this is a time of refreshment, refreshing and renewal. And so, Lord, as we continue this morning, we do pray that your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Good morning. My name is Dorothy Mann, and I am a member at Priory Park. I will be reading from John chapter 16, verses 16 to 28, from the New Living Translation. It says, Jesus went on to say, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. At this, some of his disciples said one to another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, and because I am going to the Father? They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me? No more, and then after a little while you will see me. Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the father on your behalf. No, 
the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, Priory. It's Pastor Dave. I am very privileged to introduce to you a friend of mine who's going to be preaching for me today. Uh, my family spends a week at Muskoka Bible Center every year, and so this week that's where we are. Uh, but a good friend of mine, the Reverend Tom Van Milligan, is filling in for me today. Tom has been an ordained pastor with the Christian Reformed Church for almost 30 years. Uh, he and his wife are actually both ordained with them. Tom has two grown daughters, and uh, they live in. he lives in Georgetown now. Uh, but many years ago, he was a pastor here in Guelph, and that was when Tom and I connected. We were part of a pastor's group together, and uh, Tom continued to join us even from Georgetown, and he's become a good friend. Tom loves the Lord. He loves scripture, and he's an excellent preacher. And so uh, it's my privilege to welcome the Reverend Tom Van Milligan to open scripture for us today. Thank you. Good morning, Priory Park Baptist Church. It is both an honor and a bit of an oddity to be speaking to you uh, this Sunday morning, which is actually for me Friday morning, as I record this in my home, in the studio that we've set up in our home because of the ministry that has been reshaped through COVID. You know all about that. I will say some things about myself because I'm a stranger to you as you are to me. But maybe uh, that will come out later. What I want to say, first of all, because I found that sometimes people only hear the first thing that's said in a sermon. And so I've learned to say the important things first. And one of the important things that I want to say to you about this text is how I came to it. I've been in ministry for, uh, ordained ministry for about 30 years. And I'm a little bit embarrassed to say that it's only been in the last year or so that it's occurred to me that I should ask the Holy Spirit what to talk about. So I, now when I receive an invitation to preach, like, like the one that came through Pastor Dave, I create some quietness in my spirit and I ask God, what passage do you want me to bring to this congregation? And I've learned to ask not only for a chapter, but also for verse. So this, as I asked, what should I bring to Priory Park Baptist Church? I heard John 16 and then I heard verse 24. And we had that read this morning to us. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. I'm going to start talking about this text, which as I wrestled with it, I realized was as much for me as it may be for any of you. I'm going to talk about the path that we might go on if we're not careful when we hear this instruction, ask for anything in my name. There are fairy tales in which people encounter a magical being who offers them usually three wishes and modern adaptations of this have included the subtext sub uh, instruction no wishing for more wishes a fairy tale can speak to our deepest brokenness our deepest sense of how the world should work how we want it to work and this verse too ask for anything can trigger in us 
all kinds of stuff from our brokenness. That is our sense of neediness, our sense of covetousness, our sense of greed, our sense of lust, all the deadly sins that the church fathers spoke of. When we hear somebody say, ask for anything, then it's very easy for us to go into that place where we think we are so needy. In my own tradition, which comes out of the, the Dutch Reformed churches of the 16th century, the Reformation, and then became um, an immigrant community in Canada, there is a strong bit of wisdom that we've carried forward that says, beware of lotteries, beware of games of chance. And sometimes people think, well, that's because we believe so strongly in providence and if you're meant to have it, you're gonna get it and all that stuff. But in my experience, it's, it's, it's a much more focused bit of wisdom. That is, when you engage in any kind of lottery, in any kind of chance gift. What is triggered is the sense of need. Wow, I could really use a million dollars. I could really um, take advantage of that. That would address so many of my insecurities. And so then the chances of your receiving those are astronomically against, against you. And so what's left in its wake is disappointment and discontent. We did not get what we wanted. Our need was triggered, but it was not fulfilled. And I see that the light is changing on me and I'm all of a sudden distracted by that. So I'm not sure what my projection is doing. Just ignore that. Now, I said that I would, at the beginning that I might say something about myself. One of the things that I've had to remark on, and in noting that um, Pastor Dave and I share some roots in Nova Scotia, is that his roots are very different from my roots. He grew up on one side of the tracks. I grew up on the other. He grew up on the side of the province where the soil is lush. He grew up in a the ivory walls of academia. And I grew up on the rugged, rocky South Shore on a farming, on a farm, not really in a farming community because there's so many stones in the soil, almost nothing would grow. And I'm the product, I'm the child of immigrants. So it was, we came from Southern Ontario from here. And then um, a few short years after my parents had immigrated, moved to Nova Scotia, which is kind of a second immigration. And most immigrants, if you know any, um, are financially and socially insecure. And so when I talk about triggering need, when somebody says, ask for anything, that is a huge trigger for me. I really go into kind of gluttony mode Whenever there's a couch <laughs> by the side of the road and my wife and I drive past, I'll look at her and she knows exactly what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, that's a free couch. You never turn down what's free. You always take, you always grab what's free. Immigrants tend to have that mentality that money is short and social resources, your community is fairly shallow. And so you're always on the lookout for a bargain. You're always wondering where your next paycheck is coming from, where your next meal is coming from. And so again, as the Holy Spirit directed me to this passage, as so often occurs, I realized this passage is for me. And if there's no other result this morning than that the Holy Spirit speaks to me, then it was not a wasted activity. But I believe, even though I don't know you, I believe that, that there's some commonality there. I may have that condition to an extreme, 
I may be the canary in the coal mine that, that senses what's wrong before others do. But I believe this is a, a cultural thing. We're being constantly told that we don't have enough. We're being constantly flooded with fear so that we are afraid of what's going to be taken from us or withheld from us. And furthermore, Scripture seems to be aware that this is a fundamental hurdle in the journey of faith. That is, we need to deal with this sense of neediness. We need to understand where it comes from and how to reshape it before we can hear what Jesus is saying when he says, ask for anything in my name. I just want to rehearse a few verses with you. As you're going to hear, this is a little bit like shooting fish in a barrel. Um, once you start digging up this theme of what do we do with our anxieties, our insecurities about having our needs taken care of, you will realize it, it floods scripture. So first of all, I'll start with Psalm 23, which is has become for our uh, culture one of the most important psalms. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So the psalmist starts out and says, because Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is my God, and he is the kind of God who shepherds his people and cares for them, feeds them, attends to their needs, I can say I shall never be in a state of need. I shall not want. And then Paul writing to the congregation in Rome, he says, if God didn't, if the Father did not withhold from us his only Son, how will he not, along with him, graciously give us all things? That is, the the state, the state of mind with which we apprehend the future and all of its unknowns starts out with a historic given. That is, God has already given to us the greatest possible gift. And his, his faithfulness leads us to conclude that that generosity of spirit that nature that his nature will continue he will along with jesus along with the gift of jesus graciously give us all things then there's another note from the old testament this that comes down as a name yahweh yireh in uh, 1970s uh, broken Hebrew Jehovah Jireh which comes down through the, the people of God as this phrase that Paul quotes his grace is sufficient for me his grace is enough Yahweh provides Yahweh always takes care and so the nature of his relationship with me is enough to give me confidence. And then finally, for now, because I know that as I've talked to you about these verses that talk to us about, okay, can we be taken care of? Do we, do we have any basis for saying we don't need to be afraid? You're going to think about more. But I'll leave you, last of all, with this one. Philippians 4, where Paul talks from prison and he talks to the Philippians about this gift that they've given him. And then he sort of finds himself digging out of a hole because he says, I'm, I'm not meaning to say to you that I was in need. That's not what the gift means to me, that 
I was afraid I wouldn't have, and, and therefore your gift came at such a great time that confirmed. No, he says, I've been in plenty, times of plenty. I've been in times of need. I've learned the secret of contentment. And then he tells us the secret. His understanding that he can do all things through Christ who gives him strength. So what we have here is a picture of what happens when we begin to take on our identity as children of God, when we begin to, to clothe ourselves with the gospel, when we begin to say, I'm not outside the house of God, banging on the door, hoping to convince whoever's keeping the door that I deserve to be inside. No, we find that, that God has built the house around us, that he's invited us in, taken us by the hand, invited us in, not simply as servants. The prodigal comes to his father and says, make me like one of your servants. And his father stops him before he can even get the speech out and says, my son has returned. This is the experience that we have, regardless of what kind of family we've grown up in, we absorb through our families the sense of what a family should be. We're wired for parents. We're wired to, to need care. Human babies are more vulnerable than any other mammal. We need more care. We're wired. We're designed to need our parents to care for us. And even if they don't, or if they do it poorly, and this spoiler, we all do it poorly. In spite of all that, we know what it means to be a good parent. And what God has done for us is he's welcomed us into his family. And he says, now, I want you to trust me. I want you to know that I care for you. And Jesus, in Matthew's gospel, explains it this way. He says, why are you worrying about what you should eat or what you should wear? Your father knows that you need these things. So, the long ramp up, sort of what the state of mind to dispel, to avoid, when we hear Jesus saying to us, ask for anything in my name. So then, in this state of mind of knowing that we are loved, knowing that the Lord is our shepherd, knowing that we can be content, knowing that God gave us Jesus. He's not going to abandon us. He's not going to not follow through on his investment. He's put a ton into us. He's not going to begrudge us a few more cents. Then in that state of mind, ask. So we start out by following Jesus when he teaches us to pray. We do pray for our daily bread. We do pray for protection from the evil one. Why? It's because to be loved by God doesn't mean we stop being human. In fact, I think our humanity is freed. We're opened up to, to not pretend that we've got it all together, to not pretend that we can manage, that, that we've got all our stuff in one tidy little pile. When we come to Christ, in fact, 
we have to come as needy. We have to come knowing our need. We have to come knowing that we are creatures and that our lives make no sense without a connection to the God who created us, God who rules this world. We come acknowledging that if we don't eat, we die. Now, again, we've taken that fear to become overweight and to eat too much, to eat gluttonously. But the truth is, we need to eat. Don't pretend that you're not human. When Jesus says, ask for anything, we are allowed to ask for the stuff of our daily needs. But Jesus says, pray in my name. Now, in a lot of um, Christendom, in a lot of folk kind of discipleship and training in Christian faith, that becomes a formula of ending all of our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a kind of a way of saying our prayers are done. But to pray in someone's name is to do it as if you were them. That is, when Jesus says, pray in my name, he's saying, pretend you're me. Ask as if you are me. When you talk to the Father, say, the Lord has need of it. See, the nature of threat and fear and insecurity, all of those things that I spent quite a bit of time trying to dispel in understanding what Jesus is talking to us about, the nature of those things is to focus our attention on the thing that we're afraid of. There's something that happens in the what they call the reptile section of the brain that the, the freeze, flight, or fight part of our, our humanity, where we focus and we only see the thing that we're afraid of. So for someone like me, again, grew up as in borderline poverty, um, it's very easy for me to focus on money. Very easy for me in any situation only to see how much that thing costs, how much less I'm going to have in the bank if I buy that thing. If I'm sitting at a restaurant, all I can see is the prices. It's very easy for me not to be able to enjoy the company, not to be able to enjoy the food, not to notice everything that's going around me. So the nature of our insecurity, if we are not abiding in our identity in Christ, that God is our Father, and He's a good Father, and good fathers attend to the needs of their children. It's the very nature of fatherhood. When fear is banished, when we step into the gracious gift of Christ, that children of God we are, born not of a father's will, a human decision, born not of the flesh, but of the spirit. When we step into that identity, perfect love casts out all fear. And our eyes are opened. Our eyes begin to see. I said that Fear tends to focus our attention on the thing that we're afraid of. When fear is dealt with, all of a sudden, we start paying attention to everything that's around us. When, um, again, fairly recently, 
I, through prayer ministry, through a, a, a friend, came to realize that I had a mammon idol. Jesus characterizes money as, personifies it as a very real spiritual force. And he says, you can't worship mammon and God. You worship one or the other. And I realized that there was a real conflict in my spirit about who I was going to worship. And that realization that I had an idol infestation turned me toward the understanding, the scriptural understanding of idols. And I, again, began to see how prominent a theme it is in scripture. Idolatry, the prophets say, makes us like the thing we worship. And the thing we worship, they say, is blind, deaf, mute. The prophets and the Psalms say, those who worship idols will become like them. And so when Jesus comes fulfilling the words of prophecy, giving sight to the blind, opening the ears of the deaf, opening the mouths of the mute, giving legs to the paralyzed, healing, restoring, there's a very real sense that what he's doing is overturning the effects of idolatry. That he's undoing what happens to us when we start worshiping idols. When we start taking matters into our own hands. When we start doubting that there is a God who is looking after us and who's under whose authority our lives exist. So when the Spirit of God begins its renewing work in us, applying the blood of Jesus to us, restoring us as children of God, then one of the effects is we start to see. Our eyes are opened. We start to hear. We start to speak. But in terms of how fear works, that is, our eyes are focused on the thing that we're afraid of, to be released from the bondage of idolatry is to have our eyes opened. And so when Jesus says, ask anything in my name, he's saying, start to look around you and imagine what I want. What does Jesus want? Behave like those disciples on Palm Sunday when they go into the town. Jesus says, you're going to find an animal tied there. When people ask you, what are you doing with the animal? You tell them the Lord needs it. This is a picture of of how we are to pray in Jesus' name. Ask in my name. Ask because you are being renewed in the image of Christ. For you to live is Christ. It is no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. You get the point. Scripture again is filled with this notion that we are temples of the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit in us that continues the work of Jesus. And greater things, Jesus says, will you do than even I've done. We are multiplying. We are multiplying the effect of the kingdom that Jesus came to inaugurate. And we have authority to do this because we are children of God through Jesus Christ. We have authority to ask in Jesus' name as if we are Jesus because the Spirit of God lives in us. 
And so as this spirit takes over us more and more, Paul says, be transformed. Do not conform any longer, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. As we start to see the world now, really, for the first time, having abandoned our idols, we start to look around. We start to see the world and see not only how it is, but how it could be. We start to feel the heart of God. We start to imagine if God had his way, how would our world be different? And Jesus says, ask for it. You have authority. He doesn't immediately say, change the world. There is always a danger in us to uh, see the world as it is and imagine it as God would want it to be and then go out and try to accomplish it. There's been some devastating results of that. But at the same time, we, when we learn to ask for it first, sometimes God does say to us, you are part of the fulfillment of this prayer. I've placed this vision of my kingdom in your heart so that you could be part of its fulfillment. So Jesus says, on the eve of his leave taking from them, from his disciples, up till this time I have not told you to ask for things in my name, but I'm going to the Father's side. I'm going to be interceding for you. And the work of the kingdom is now in your authority to ask the Father. We are not taking Jesus' name in vain. We are not asking, using this authority to fulfill our own needs. We are not playing the lottery with God. But as our eyes are opened, as we see the world around us, we are asking, Lord, in Jesus' name, heal this person. Lord, in Jesus' name, turn this heart, this person's heart towards you. Lord, in Jesus' name, restore justice to our nation. Lord, in Jesus' name, allow food to be distributed more evenly throughout the world. And finally, and I'll just be brief about this. Jesus says that the, the upshot of asking these things is that our joy may be complete, that our joy may be fulfilled. That is, I think, even though he doesn't go on to say much about this, that the relationship that we have, two things, the relationship that we have with the Father can be a little bit cerebral. That is, we can sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's easy to say the words, but sometimes it's hard to believe them, to let them shape how we think and feel. So when Jesus says, ask anything in my name and you will receive and your joy will be complete. That is, when we say, Lord, in Jesus' name, remove this demonic presence from our community. And God does it. Our joy is completed our our sense of yes we really do belong to the father he really does care for us he really does respond to us as if we were his children and jesus really is 
the Son of the Father. He really he was speaking truth when he said to us that we could ask anything in his name. There's that sense of, of completion that the loop is closed. And the second thing, the second sense of joy is that the things we are asking for are not simply magic tricks. They're not simply saying, Jesus saying this, if you ask that mountain to be thrown into the heart of the sea, it will be done. And we do that and everybody says, whoa, that was so cool. When we begin to see with content hearts and unanxious minds. When the Spirit of God that brooded over the chaos begins to shape how we imagine and we begin to pray into kingdom imagination and then we begin to see God answering our prayers in the name of Jesus. The result of that is not just, wow, God can do anything. It's look at the kinds of things God does. Look at the amazing things that are on his heart. That he has placed in our heart. And now we begin to see with our own eyes. People being healed. Creation being restored. Humanity stepping forward. These things bring us joy. And each of us is wired a little bit differently for God's joy. It's part of our creation uniqueness. Whether it's in human relationships or in music or in gardening or in architecture. We are wired to respond to God's beauty. And when we ask, in the authority of Christ, that the work of Christ be continued in this world. And when we begin to see it, we experience great joy. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we claim our identity in Jesus Christ. Again, we say no to the deceiver, to the liar, to the accuser who says, how dare you identify with the Father? We say no through the grace of Christ. We are children of God, your children. And we give you thanks. We give you thanks that your spirit abides within us to continue to tell us this truth. We ask Lord, that this week, whatever you have spoken to us through this message on this text, we ask that our eyes will be open to see us, to see you giving us an opportunity to lean in, to practice what you've taught us, because you're a good teacher. We ask that your name will be glorified. We ask that our joy will be multiplied. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
As a benediction today, I would like to leave you with Paul's prayer over the Ephesian church. Paul writes, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family, or all fatherhood in heaven and on earth, derives its name. May God, out of his glorious riches, strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith. And may you, being rooted and established in love, have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And may you know this love that surpasses knowledge. May you be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen. Go in peace.